Uh, hello and welcome to the next episode of uh, my podcast Deep Talks. My today's guest is uh, Spencer Greenberg. Welcome, Spencer. And Spencer is a mathematician. You have a PhD in uh, applied math. That's great here from uh, NIU. And your specialty is machine learning. So we're going to discuss mm-hmm. that definitely great. in the future. And you're an entrepreneur. Uh, I noted down that uh, you creating a software companies that uh, solve the big problems of the world. Well, that's we try. Great. We try. Yeah, that's We're amazing. So, and I have two examples, like the uplift. Maybe you can uh, tell us more what uplift is and what you are focusing on there. Sure. So, uplift is an app we made to try to help people suffering from depression. Yeah, that's great. So, and it's like chatbot or no? So. Um, So basically, have you heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, Mm -hmm. which is one of the most evidence-based techniques for helping people with depression? So we try to create the best cognitive behavioral therapy self-help. So if you are not willing to go to a therapist Mm -hmm. or or get help in another way, you can download our app and we teach you the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a set of skills that you can apply in your life to try to become less depressed. And do you have any data how it works, how many uh, clients you have and what what is their progress? Yeah, so we just launched Mm -hmm. it, but we actually ran a pilot study And we found that the first 80 people that completed our program, they got about a 52% reduction in their depressive wow. symptoms. And then we actually followed up six months later, and they found they maintained almost the whole benefit. So we were really excited to see that. And yeah, we just launched it. It's in the iPhone App Store. It'll be on mm-hmm. Android soon. And we have about 250 paying customers so far. So. But that's really cool, like helping people with depression. It's definitely one of uh, those big problems we as a society have. And the second uh, startup is uh, Clear Thinker. So can you tell us something more about that too? Yeah, so clearthinking.org is our website. And so what we do there is we try to take results from cognitive science, psychology, math, economics that that are very valuable, but that most people have not applied to their lives. Mm-hmm. And we try to create... we to create free interactive tools to help you apply these results to your life. So whether it's trying to avoid problems with planning, trying to make better life decisions, uh, trying to find ways to be happier, we've got tools for all these different things that you can go use on our website, clearthing.org. That's just great. Yeah, those are all my uh, fields of interest. So <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you yeah. having you here. Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, let me let me ask you, like, what are the the biggest problems the world uh, has uh, according to you? What, what do you think? Like so, three, five of them. So the world has a lot of really big problems, but the type of problem that I tend to focus on are in the domain of social science. And so that, uh, if we're thinking about social science specifically, uh, it's mental health, huge problem. Health. So about one in 12 people have clinical depression. Mm-hmm. Many people don't realize how common it is, and it's very severe. And then way more than that, even have mild depression, because mild is more common than, than the clinical form. And then anxiety, about one in eight people have anxiety disorders, which again, can be really... Severe. So, th- so that's just mental health. Um, then we have decision making. Um, I believe that people could become much better decision makers than they are today. So I think of that as this kind of pernicious problem where people are making decisions that aren't the best for themselves, aren't the best for society, right? With many negative consequences. Um, and then we have things like cognitive biases, where people um, are basically misunderstanding what's true about the world because of the nature of the way our brains work, and so many things like that. Yeah, uh, was it a beautiful discussion with Daniel Kahneman like three three weeks ago, and mm-hmm. uh, he was a bit skeptical. He told uh, us something like, "Even we know a lot of about cognitive biases, still." It's like a huge gap between what science knows and what people do in their lives. And exactly. uh, even if you know biases, you are still influenced by them. So how to how to transform that um, bridge between what science knows and uh, what people do? How to help them to benefit out of those research? That's a good question. I've actually discussed this with Daniel Kahneman myself. <laughs> and I know he's more on the skeptical side. I'm very skeptical. I, I was a bit sad. Like uh, He yeah. should be like, oh, let's change the world. And he was like, no, we cannot change the world. And I was like... Well, that's so sad. It's common. It's very skeptical. So yes, but keep in mind, he's an incredible skeptical personality. Yep. and that's a great asset of his in his of scientific course, research. Yeah. Um, one reason I'm more optimistic is I've just seen all the benefits that accrued to me, and this is how I initially got excited about mm-hmm. doing work on cognitive biases. Um, my route into it was originally through cognitive behavioral therapy. One part of cognitive behavioral therapy is learning to identify distortions in your thinking mm-hmm. when you're emotional. So if you're feeling upset, noticing that your your emotions are actually kind of distorting the thoughts you're having and making them less realistic and helpful. Um, and so I saw the huge benefits of learning to do that. And then also getting into mindfulness and learning to separate, oh, I'm having the thought that something is true. It doesn't mean the thing is actually true. Mm-hmm. 
is another really useful thing. And so I just started seeing all these ways that my life was being benefited. And I said, okay, can I take this best research and find ways to apply it to other people's lives to kind of systematically get the gains that I'm seeing? Um, and so that's what we've tried to do. And I do think it's in its infancy, like the, the state of the art of helping people avoid biases still needs a ton of work, but that's what we're trying right. to do, yeah. And do you focus on a large scale? Large scale? <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. So clearthing.org, our website, anyone can go on there. We're trying to help anyone who wants to um, improve their lives in these ways. Um, but other people are doing kind of a more intensive deep dive kind of strategy, which is like, like the Center for Applied Rationality. They're taking a very different approach. Okay. So and how, how is uh, mindfulness connected to uh, cognitive behavior therapy? Right. So mindfulness, which is an you know, idea from meditation, um, one thing that you learn when you're practicing meditation is that as you're trying to meditate, thoughts will interrupt. Mm -hmm. And you learn to sort of get a detachment from the thoughts, right? A lot of times when we have a thought, we, quote, fuse with the thought, which means we're like living right. inside yeah. it. You're like, mm -hmm. you th have the thought, you know, Bill's an asshole. And, and in that moment, you really believe Bill's an asshole. But with the kind of meditation practice, you can learn to say, oh, I had the thought that Bill's an asshole. Is Bill really right. an asshole? Or am I just, is that just the mm -hmm. thought that popped in my mind? And cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the skills it teaches you is to challenge the thoughts that you have that are causing bad patterns in your life. And so you'll have the thought, Bill's an asshole, and you'll have, and your response might be, you know, what's the evidence that Bill is an asshole? Is he actually an asshole? So right. it's kind of, there's so an it's, analog. It's very connected it's very together. Connected. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how about critical thinking? Like, uh, we live in the world that your president here is denying uh, climate change, and there is a lot of fake news outside. So how to fight with that, like with that lack of creative, uh, critical thinking in broader society? Yeah, it is, it is a really big problem. And I'll just say that from my perspective, the, the big problem is not so much really silly news stories that are completely made up. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger problem is actually a lack of general skepticism of your inside group mm -hmm. and excess of skepticism of the outside group, right? So everyone trusts their own authorities, right? You know, your own, your own trusted authority, of course you believe what they say. <clears throat> and everyone's distrustful of, you know, the enemy group's authorities. And I think um, what happens in American society today a lot is that uh, Democrats will distrust whatever the Republicans say and Republicans will distrust mm -hmm. whatever the, the, the Democrats say. And I think of that as the more fundamental, bigger problem. And so if we think about uh, how to become better thinkers as a society, I think there's a bunch of key things that need to be put in place. And so one of the most fundamental is probabilistic thinking. Okay. As long as people are stuck in a frame of this is true or false, right or wrong, good or bad. Black and white. Black or white. Then basically it's very hard to be a nuanced thinker. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thinking works really well for tribal sort of thinking. Mm -hmm. Does my tribe agree with this or disagree with this? Is this person you know, in my tribe or not in my tribe? Um, but it works terribly at figuring out the truth about the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the core skills that needs to be taught is this probabilistic thinking. And then once you have that basic idea that no matter how confident you are, there's a sliver of possibility you're wrong. Right. Because everything's That's probabilistic. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're 99% sure, but you're not 100% sure. Once you have that, then you can start talking about more nuanced ideas built on top of that, like how to adjust the probabilities as you gain evidence and, and what are the rules of evidence and things like that. Uh, my anecdotal experience is that uh, more humble people, people are, more probabilistic thinker they are. Mm -hmm. is, is it connected or do we have any data about that? Like the, you know, the humbleness is important? Well, one thing I will say is I think once you start adapting kind of probabilistic viewpoint, then it can, can make you more humble because you realize that anything you say and anything you believe, there's a chance you're wrong. And so you have, always have that little idea that, okay, but there's a 5% chance I'm actually wrong here. And actually, and there's some techniques that I think actually promote that humbleness too, which is like getting people to make a prediction or make a bet, right? So someone's like, oh, I'm totally confident X, Y, Z. And you're like, okay, I'll bet you 10 bucks. <laughs> and they're like, well, maybe I'm not that confident, right? Um, but I, you know, I do that with myself. I, try, I actually, I use this um, fun tool called <clears throat> Prediction Book, which lets you make predictions about things in your life and then tell, and you put in the date when you'll know the answer. Okay. And then you will find out if you were right. And so I've been now for years tracking predictions about all kinds of things in my life. How many uh, money you lost already? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they're not, those ones are not for money, but they're just, okay. it's like okay. a scorecard, okay. record yeah. keeping. Okay. And, and you actually have to assign a probability. You don't just say, is this going to happen or not? You say a 90% chance, 30% chance. Mm -hmm. And then what you can see is if you're what's called calibrated. And ca calibrated is the idea that if you say you're 90% confident, 90% of the time you should be right. Yep. Yeah. I think that everyone uh, has a story that was uh, 100% right and then he realizes he's wrong. And exactly. To, re to just remind those uh, moments maybe can help you too, like to realize that if, even if you are 100% sure, well, 
it probably means that you are wrong. Exactly. And remember that time when you were 100 percent sure, but you turned out you were yeah. wrong. And in fact, that's when people tend to be most overconfident mm-hmm. is when they're at the extremes. Like when someone thinks they're like 100 percent chance of the thing, that's mm-hmm. when they tend to be most biased. Uh, in my world, like the critical thinking is like two things. Like it's a skill, like to be a good thinker, yeah. and then it's a value. For me, it's more about like starting like to teach people to have critical thinking as a value and then yeah. teach them the uh, concrete skills how to like build build it build it in the long term so yeah, tell point. me tell tell me like how to how to uh, spread critical thinking as a value what 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 are ideas on that but it's interesting you bring up values because actually I do research on values and so we've been trying to characterize all the different values that people have and we actually think there's more than 20 different ones mm-hmm. everything from justice to reducing suffering Uh, to equality and and so on, um, and not everyone has truth as a core value. But even if people don't have truth as a core value, they may have it as an instrumental value. In other words, almost everyone values truth for what it gets them. Right. And so, if you maybe you don't care about truth per se, but maybe you do care about you know making good decisions so you have a good life. Well, then you should start caring about evidence because evidence is going to help you mm-hmm. figure out how to make the right decisions. And so, I think there's ways in of getting people interested in it. For instrumental reasons, but then once they're getting used to using critical thinking techniques, maybe they, they'll start using them in other ways. And do you think that schools should play some role in that? I think in an ideal world, um, schools would teach things very differently than they do today, and teach, teach very different content. That's very sad, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I'm listening to uh, what one uh, audio book now, and it's 100 year old, and uh, it's about how to improve uh, schools, and <laughs> the discussion is the same like we do today. So yeah, it's it, so sad that the schools are quite the same as they were like 100 years ago. Yeah, and I think the I same think, model. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a lot of problems with what we teach today mm. because there's an attitude that um, that oh kids aren't really learning this material because they need to know these facts, right? Mm. It's about learning how to learn, right? But if a lot of people say that, but if you're like, okay, but are they really teaching you how to learn? And I think the answer is largely not. Like there are known things about how to teach people how to learn efficiently. Mm. And I think that would be useful to include in the curriculum. But instead, we make kids memorize lots and lots of facts that then inevitably they don't remember. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think that we should have something like uh, not only subjects, but what I call a meta subject, like subject about other subjects, how mm. to uh, improve your learning skills. Yeah how to, I don't know, improve your memory and so on. So uh, this this is what I really miss in here and everywhere in schools because uh, I think that like learning facts is in today's world like nothing because you have your Wikipedia in your pocket. But uh, to really teach y- yourself or learn how to use like mm, some mm, creative skills, metacognition and so on, it's much more important than learn facts. So how yeah. schools can uh, do some transition between, like, upgrade the model? Like, what do you think about it? Like, well, honestly, I'm not too optimistic because I think there's a lot of structural and cultural and bureaucratic reasons why schools will continue being the way they are for a really long time. But I think if if someone wanted to create a new school with a different paradigm, they could start with the question: What are the actually important things for kids to know? Yeah. What are the meta skills? What are the Um, you know, and, and then once you start there and you build it from the ground up, I think you would end up with something very different than a school today. And then another question you could ask is, what are the efficient ways to teach kids? And I think you would realize that, for example, people learn much, much faster if they have constant quizzing on the material. Yeah, right. So rather than teach them a thing and then test them a month later and then never test them again, yeah. it would be more like teach them a thing and you're constantly giving rolling quizzes mm. on everything mm. they've ever learned mm. that build up. And this is this idea of spaced repetition yeah. um, and it's so much more efficient. And is there any startup that is focusing on that? Like, do you know about uh, someone who's like focusing on changing education as a whole? You know, there are a lot of uh, startups that have tried to work on the problem of like how to improve education. But I think, uh, you know, there are major structural challenges, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, maybe you can get a school to move from here to there a slight amount, but, you know, there's there's too much uh, momentum in a particular direction. Yeah. It's so sad because I really think that if we don't do uh, anything, our kids will go to the same schools as we did, and I don't want that. Like I want some like important changes yeah. in education because you, you see that uh, like all the main problems we have, it's grounded in the lack of critical thinking and it's grounded in the lack of, of those skills we need today. 
and schools should play an important role and but they don't so for me it's it's uh, one of the big challenges we have but still yeah. i don't know the the solution too like it's yeah absolutely and i think one thing that would be really really valuable to teach the kids is to to learn to recognize patterns of bad reasoning mm -hmm. um, which really has to be at an intuitive level it's almost like martial arts you have to just practice over and over again until bad arguments kind of just pop out at you is like oh that's invalid like you, mm -hmm. you still hear so many adults say things like well my uncle tried this thing and they um, seem better so it probably works and you're like that is not a valid form of reasoning no. um, and if if in the school level kids were taught the the mm -hmm. valid and valid forms of reasoning i think then as adults we wouldn't accept bad reasoning like that yeah right this is amazing like to, to uh do um training of recognizing bad reasoning can really improve uh, one skill to uh, do it in the future. So I really think that we should, I don't know, uh, have a special subject about uh, about that in schools. Because as, as you see, like if you uh, have a discussion on Facebook or somewhere, it's full of uh, those argumentation flaws, it's full of ba bad reasoning. And uh, it makes me crazy because you cannot argue with someone that uh, has a lack of argumentation skills, so... Right, and we wouldn't accept someone making arithmetic errors in an argument, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all learn arithmetic in school. Yeah, we right. accept, oh, That's three, great, three plus two yeah. is five, right? But we accept all kinds of bad arguments. Yeah. Um, and also, some of this stuff is pretty subtle, and it really does take a lot of practice. Like, for example, um, the anecdotal evidence of, oh, my uncle tried this thing and he seems better, that's generally a bad argument, but there are special cases where that's a good argument. For example, let's say your uncle had a disease for 20 years and it didn't fluctuate at all. It was just mm -hmm. the same for 20 years. And then your uncle tried a new medicine and it went away within an hour. Mm -hmm. That would be really actually very strong evidence that it worked. Yep. Um, but for the most part, anecdotes like that are not good evidence. And so try to understand the difference there. Mm -hmm. For example, for uh, like the, the anti-wax movement, mostly they use anecdotal evidences as a, uh, as a proof that, uh, I don't know, autism uh, influence uh, is influenced by, by vaccination, right? But it's not a good, uh, good example. My bioethicist mm -hmm. friend says that the only thing we know for sure doesn't cause autism is vaccines, <laughs> because it's the only thing that's right. been studied that much. Yeah. And um, do you study how to change one's mind? Like, if someone is the core, uh, hardcore anti-vax -vac uh, supporter, how to change his belief? Like. What is the best way how to argue with those people? Yeah, so first of all, there's you know there's a whole realm of persuasion tactics. But for that kind of thing, I tend to prefer um, what you might think of as asymmetric persuasion tactics. So, so some persuasion tactics like talking really confidently and being likable and being attractive and things like that, mm -hmm. the problem with them is they work just as well to convince someone of falsehoods as they do to convince someone of the truth, right? So I think if you want to promote truth in the world, you also want to promote persuasion tactics that are asymmetrical, mm -hmm. where they're a lot easier to use for true things than for false things. Um, so there might be effective wow. ways to... yeah, that's so clever, yeah. That's... So there might be ways to jam something down mm -hmm. someone's throat using tricky persuasion, but really you should try to stick mm -hmm. to getting them into the paradigm of you know, thinking about reason, mm -hmm. thinking about evidence. Now, with something like an anti, someone who's fighting against vaccines for years and you're trying to convince them that actually vaccines are okay, you have to understand so much of their identity is gonna be wrapped up in that, mm -hmm. in that view. Think about how many people they've told about their view. Think mm -hmm. about how bad they would feel about themselves if they realized they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think a, a thing that oftentimes very logical people forget is all the emotional aspects of convincing yeah. someone, right? And uh, often, it can backfire too. Like if you are trying to persuade someone, maybe at the end uh, he is uh, even more uh, hardcore anti-vax than he was before. So there's a lot of data about the backfire effect. So how to like uh, not to do, do uh, the situation even worse? Yeah, and I, I th my suspicion about the backfire effect because it doesn't always show up. It sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. My suspicion is that it's about triggering the in-group out-group reflex. Mm -hmm. Like if you if I'm trying to convince you of something and suddenly you're like, wait you're in the enemy group and you're just trying to beat me, mm -hmm. well, what are you going to do? You're yeah. going to be like, okay, let's br bring it on. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fight even harder, right? So I think um, one of the really key things if you're trying to persuade someone is you have to show how you're in the same group as them in some way. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you agree with them on everything, mm -hmm. but you have to have some starting point where they don't feel like you're in the enemy group because then just then it's just a, a war. And mm -hmm. this goes to my, my friend Julia Galef has a wonderful idea that she talks about of scout mindset versus soldier mindset. 
And um, it's this idea of a scout. Imagine a scout in war. The scout is sent out to figure out the truth about how many troops are there in the enemy's camp, what's the lay of the land. The scout's not trying to win anything. The scout's just trying to figure out the truth. Whereas the soldier's going in to try to win. And the thing is that a lot of times in society, people are actually in soldier mindset, which means they're right. not... Like, imagine a debate on TV. You think they're actually trying to persuade each other? Mm. They're it's not. Fight. It's pure fight. Yeah. It's pure fight. There's no, they're, no, they're not persuading each other at all. They're just trying mm. to win <clears throat> according to the audience. And so a key question is, who is in scout mindset? Who's in soldier's mm. mindset in this situation? And if both people are not in scout, the game is already lost. Mm. But, you know, like, uh, if there are two groups, like Republicans and Democrats, like, how to teach them to be scouts because... It's it's a very long term problem, and it it's is. getting worse and worse. We have data that it's getting worse. So it is, it is a really big problem. Well, on an interpersonal level, mm-hmm. when you're talking to someone, the key is to make sure you're in scout mindset. That you're mm-hmm. ac- which means you're actually willing to change your mind at that moment. If they mm-hmm. make a really good point, you're willing to acknowledge it and say, okay, that's a really good point. Maybe I don't change my whole worldview, mm-hmm. but maybe I'm going to shift my worldview. You know, again, thinking about probabilities. Mm-hmm. Maybe before I was 95% confident, now I'm 90% because you made a good point. If okay. you're not willing to do that, you're not in scout mindset. So that's the first problem. And then the second problem is, are they in scout mindset? And you do you put them in scout mindset by being by making them feel like you're on the same team. You're like you're part of the same group working to figure out the truth. Okay. And do you have any uh, like your own anecdotal evidence of uh, the situation that you really persuade someone and change his mind? Like you t- took I don't know a uh, Trump supporter and change his yeah. mind, or you took a uh, anti-vax core anti-vax, uh, hardcore anti-vaxxer and change his mind. So do you have well, any good examples? My, my favorite example of it, because it was the most personally meaningful mm-hmm. to me, is that my friend was dating someone who's totally sociopathic and was really causing them harm. And okay. I convinced her to, to leave him. And later she came and said that I, she thought I saved her life. And that was incredibly meaningful to me because I feel like it was like one of the biggest impacts mm-hmm. I'd had on someone that I know. And the way that I actually got her to be persuaded is mm-hmm. I actually had her She was open-minded at that moment. She was in scout mindset, right? And I had her make a list of all the things that he does that she thinks are unacceptable for a partner to do. And then I had her keep this list with her. for I made her promise to hold, keep this list with her okay. all for a whole That's day so clever. Yeah. as she went around. And then the next day, she broke it off with him. And so, mm-hmm. so you know, that's just one technique in that one particular scenario. But Okay, do you have any other techniques? Because I think it's very important and everyone has any, I don't know, relatives or... Uh, grandfathers and uh, close friends that they believe something and you see that it uh, it harms them a lot. So yeah. I think that's a very useful technique to to help them. So do you have any other yeah. techniques? So uh, so talking about that, so I have this a phrase I like to use, which, which is philosophical mm-hmm. disorders, right? Mm-hmm. We all know about psychological disorders like depression and anxiety, but philosoph- what I, def- I, define, oh. I define a philosophical disorder to be a false belief that's harming you, right? So if now if you had a false belief that was helping you, you could say, well, maybe on practical grounds it's worth believing, right? Mm. And if you had a true belief that's harming you, you could say, well, at least you're being realistic, right? At least you're a realist. But if you have a false belief that's harming you, there's really no justification. And really, it would be good if we could figure out a way to help people with false, harmful beliefs to not have them. Um, and I like to, in terms of thinking about how to help people with philosophical disorders, I like to use a metaphor of Imagine that people's belief system is a, is a house with multiple levels, right? Mm-hmm. And they're columns that hold up the house. And the key is to identify which of those columns actually bear weight in their belief system. Because a lot of times you could, you should, someone, you could say, well, why do you believe that vaccines cause autism? And someone could say, well, because my friend's child got a vaccine and then I got autism mm-hmm. right after. And let's say you proved it actually wasn't true. Let's say you're mm-hmm. like, actually, I got the records that showed that actually they'd already been diagnosed with autism. Do you think mm-hmm. that person's going to change their mind? Of no, course of course not. Because that particular belief, when you said, why do you believe it? And the thing that they answered with was not a weight-bearing column in their belief system. Right. Mm. So you have to try to figure out what are the actual weight-bearing columns. Mm. And you also have to give them a way out. Because if you just knock over a weight-bearing column, what do you think is going to happen? Mm. They're going to be upset, confused, anxious. So you have to understand their belief structure so mm. you can give them something else to hold up their belief structure, right? But sometimes it's a really uh, big part of their personality, like yeah. very like uh, their like internal belief that they really uh, think that that's the truth with capital T. So how to uh, tackle those uh, problems? Like if they really are 100% sure and it's part of their personality. Yeah, it is really hard. But 
Um, sometimes it comes about by changing the social setting mm-hmm. or social situation. Um, imagine someone is you know lives with all the people around them believe a certain thing for many many years. All right. <clears throat> During so it might be incredibly hard for them to change their mind at that moment because mm-hmm. even if they start shifting their belief, the kind of the culture around them is going to push them right back. Also, our subconscious can be pretty smart about guessing what will happen. So if you start doubting. Let's say, let's say you were raised in a particular mm-hmm. religion, you start doubting that religion, mm-hmm. you might be filled with anxiety and all these unpleasant feelings because you start your subconscious predicting all these negative ramifications of mm-hmm. that self-doubt, right? But if you move them to a situation where other people don't believe it, and suddenly mm-hmm. the ramifications aren't that bad. The mm-hmm. people around them will accept them with a new belief. They haven't told everyone that they believe this other thing. So yeah, yeah that, that's why I think that traveling can open uh, one's uh, mind a lot Absolutely. because if you, I, my, uh, for, from the last year I lived in Japan, I lived in Europe, I, and now I live in the US, and those cultures are so different, and it helped me a lot of like to be be different person because I'm surrounded by so different people, and uh, I think that's one of the best way how to uh, learn humbleness to tra- travel more. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this is part of the reason why college can be such a life-changing experience. Because the, right. for a lot of people, it's the first time that they're out of that initial community. And they're in a totally new community of different types of people. And suddenly they're like, well, all of those beliefs they used to have are not being reinforced anymore. Yeah, right. So, and uh, one other thing I want to discuss with you is effective altruism. Yeah. Tell me more about effective altruism because I really like that movement. So. Mm-hmm. Right. So effective altruism is one way to think about it as a community of people that are trying to ask the question, how do we do the most good with our time, with our money, using reason and evidence? And I think that's a nice clean definition. How to do the most good using reason and evidence. It's a bunch of people trying to figure that out. Now, one of the things that happens, though, is as you dig into that, you realize that that way of thinking ends up being quite different than the way most people think about doing good. Mm -hmm. And so very quickly, you start realizing that from that perspective of doing the most good, a lot of people are not living up to that. Um, and so, but, but I think there's actually pr- some pretty strong arguments to be favorable to that idea. Um, so one of them is whatever you value, whatever it is, if you're going to give your money to try to create more of that, like let's say it's you know, preventing poverty or improving education or whatever, presumably with that amount of money, that $1,000 or $100 or whatever you're donating, you want to help do more good rather than less good, right? Okay. I think almost everyone would say they'd rather do more good than less good. Okay. Well, how do we do that? Well, you've got to use either reason or evidence because why else would you be able to get the right answer of how to do more good and less good? Um, and a lot of people have, a, I actually have run a study on this and found that a lot of people think that the difference between like the best charity, the most effective charity in a space, mm-hmm. like the most effective, let's say poverty charity, and the average is not that big a difference, right? Mm-hmm. They think, oh, maybe it's a little more efficient. Maybe it saves some money here and there. That's actually totally wrong. It turns out the difference in the best charity and the sort of average can be huge. Right. And the reason is usually not because the best charity is like good at like saving pennies, right? It's because the best charity has a different way of trying to solve that problem that just turns out to be way more efficient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's about combination between, I don't know, uh, d- doing a good and use critical thinking for going good. Yeah, do- doing exactly. good. So I re- really like this concept because those are my two core values. One is doing good and the second use critical thinking. So yeah, w- when I f- first uh, real, uh, found EA, uh, Effective Altruism, I was so happy that I was like, <laughs> okay, that's it. That's exactly what work needs these days. And for me, it was one of the best news, uh, I don't know, uh, in the last five years or I don't <laughs> know. Uh, so I'm very happy that there is a bunch of people are fo- that, uh, that are focusing on this, uh, these problems. Yeah, great. And j- just so you know, so on our website, um, clearthing.org, we actually have a tool um, called Leave Your Mark on the World that helps you think about how to be more effective in your impact mm-hmm. on the world. And so what we do is we ask you a bunch of questions about what is it that you care about doing? Do you help care about poverty? Do you care about animals? Do you care about something else? And then we help you think about the principles of effectiveness and apply them to your own doing good. And uh, do you have... Any like list of, I don't know, 10, the most important problems the world has or uh, as effective altruists? So I don't have such a list, but I can tell you some things that, so effective altruists is this kind of community, people trying to figure out how to do the most good. And there's certain answers that currently they tend to have converged on. Um, you know, those are, could change over time. Maybe maybe people will change their mind. but. The, the current answers that a lot of people have converged on, and they, there's disagreements internally over which is the most important among them. But one is global poverty, right? Mm-hmm. 
So there are people today that live in desperate poverty where money goes a really long way. And so, for example, there's a charity, Give Directly, that tries to identify some of the poorest people in the world that are not poor for any fault of their own. They're just poor because structurally they're in a place that's very poor. And it just tries to efficiently get money to them. Mm-hmm. So donors like in the US and Europe and other places, they'll take that money and very efficiently get into And they'll often give it to an entire village. So like everyone in the village gets this money. And um, because those people are so strapped for money, there's very effective things they can do to improve their lives. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one approach, it's global poverty. And in global poverty, another approach would be like, um, uh, bed nets for trying to reduce malaria, mm-hmm. like so right. against malaria foundation, yeah. which can really save the tons of lives for children, for example. Okay. And so those tend to be really effective in that space. And then another answer people, some people converge on in the factory mm-hmm. filters movement is trying to help animals. And the argument here goes that in a typical factory farm, uh, which is in the U S factory farms are almost all of production of animal products come from factory farms. Animals live incredibly bad lives. Mm-hmm. Like, if you believe that animals have consciousness, then it's very hard to think that they're not suffering tremendously. Yeah. You know, you'll have like three chickens in a cage that's so tiny, you can barely mm-hmm. imagine it. Mm-hmm. And so if it, animals can experience pain, they're probably in tremendous amount of pain. And then you multiply that, you think about how big the numbers are, of how yeah. many animals are living like that, and it's just unbelievable. So, so another kind of segment is saying, hey, maybe there's effective things we can do to reduce the amount of meat people eat or make ethical alternatives like plant-based foods um, <clears throat> and, and that sort of thing. Okay, and then the third big area that effective altruists tend to, some effective altruists tend to focus on is trying to save the world from massive disaster. Mm-hmm. So that means either human extinction or ca- huge cat- catastrophes that could really set back civilization. Yep. And the, the argument there is, well, first of all, like if everyone in the world died, that would be really, really, really horrible. Uh, it would even be more horrible because then future humans wouldn't exist. And so you think about all you miss out on the future of humanity, right? Yeah. And so that's another, another big area. Yeah. And what are uh, examples of those disasters? Yeah. Like- so so the, the classic one that a lot of people are on board with is nuclear war. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's this idea of nuclear winter where if enough nuclear weapons went off, it could actually affect the global mm-hmm. climate and cause nu- nuclear winter. And that could be really devastating. Um, another one that's kind of more science fiction sounding, but I think is worth taking very seriously, is threats from artificial intelligence. Yeah, you have PhD in uh, maths so, and uh, machine learning, so it's yeah. basically part of uh, artificial intelligence. So mm-hmm. tell me, what, what is your estimations of a future? Are you scared or are you like uh, skeptic or are you the one who's promoting that? So what's your points on that? Yeah, so first of all, I would say that any threat any why any threat that could be a, a threat to the entire civilization or even the existence of our species, even if it had a one percent chance, it should be taken extremely mm. seriously. Right. You know, I mean, I would take seriously a one percent chance of my of you know my own death. Right. Talk yeah. about the death of the entire species. Yeah. So so the bar for taking these things really really seriously mm-hmm. and devoting significant resources to them should be more like one in a thousand. Right. Not mm. you shouldn't have to be like a fifty exactly. percent chance. Right. Um, okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that. Um, if you think about why is it that humans control the world today? Is it because we're really strong? You know, I think actually chimps would probably beat us in you know hand to hand combat. <laughs> but the thing is really just that we're intelligent, right? So so the question is, will scientists one day build machines that are smarter than humans? Yeah, probably we will. Like uh, I'm quite sure that we will. Certainly, there's a trend towards it, right? Every year, our machines no. get more intelligent. Um, humans don't seem to be getting more intelligent that much faster. <laughs> you know, maybe we are getting a little more intelligent. We've got the internet and things like that help us be smarter in some ways. But machines are going very fast in, yeah. into higher intelligence. So and after yeah. that tipping point, no one knows what happened. Yeah. So the question. So so one way to think about the threat, the possible threat of artificial intelligence is if one day we build something much smarter than us, mm. then a if a, a group controls that threat, it controls that artificial intelligence. Does that give that group some kind of control over the world, mm. right? And that's always scary because, well, we don't. Do we really want one group to have control over the world? Uh, in the same mm. way that imagine, imagine you had in your pocket the po- the power of the brain of Einstein, plus mm. you know all the greatest scientists that ever lived, plus Warren Buffett, and imagine you could just tap that power. Mm. What could you do, right? Yeah. Um, so that's one possible. Or B, what if even worse potentially, someone builds machines much more intelligent than us, and we and they're not in control of them, right? Yep. That's even potentially scarier. Mm. Um, so it's not that anyone would try to make an evil creature. Nobody's going to do that. Mm. 
But there are interesting questions about how you would control. Like, for example, imagine chimps try to control humans. How would that go, right? Okay. And so it's similar. If we try to control an artificial intelligence much more intelligent, will we actually be able to do it? Mm. And your uh, estimations are like when it's going to happen? Like, I think it's incredibly hard to say. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in five years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it's going to take 500 years. You know, I think it's. I think there's a possibility that machines will be smarter than us in our lifetimes, and and we have to take that very very seriously yeah. and think about what the, if that happens, what are the consequences, and, and are we prepared? And do you have any ideas how to like uh, how to be more responsible in that? Like how to do some policies or something that can yeah. prevent those uh, worst scenarios? Yeah, well, I think um, one of the most important things is having more of the money in artificial intelligence being devoted to studying the risks and how to mm -hmm. mitigate them, rather than into how to make it go faster and get smarter and smarter. Because right now it's very asymmetric. Almost mm -hmm. all the research is in how to make it smarter, faster, mm -hmm. and almost none of the research is in yeah. how to protect it. And there's some really, and this sounds very pie in the sky, but there's some really great papers mm -hmm. coming out about very specific research topics about AI risk, mm -hmm. about Okay, how do you make sure a system's doing what you think it's mm. doing? How do you make sure a system isn't misleading you? Mm. So one interesting thought experiment is if you're dealing with a pretty dumb mm. system, the system's never going to purposely lie to you to mm. achieve the goal you gave it, mm. right? But imagine that you imagine you make a really intelligent system and you say to the system, "I want you to trade stocks on the internet and make money," right? Yep. There might be cases where the system actually can make more money by lying to you because, mm -hmm. for example, if it knows that you're going to shut yeah. it off, mm -hmm. if it says X, Y, Z, it figures out that if it, if it doesn't lie to you, you're going to shut it off, and so it can make less money, yeah. right? So, yeah. And uh, yeah. another problem is f for me is that uh, like a lot a lot of things is happening in China now. Like for yeah. example, uh, I read the statistics about how many research on CRISPR 2 uh, edit gene editing yeah. technology is made in China. And okay, we can have a great uh, policies here in US, in Europe, but in China they probably never accept any uh, policies against or or so. Yeah. For me, it's much careful because uh, now you need only five clever guys. They can work from hotel somewhere and they can invent uh, crazy technology there. So yeah, it's a great point. So the philosopher Nick Bostrom <clears throat> has this idea he talks about called the unilateralist curse. And the idea of the unilateralist curse is that imagine you have a bunch of well-intentioned actors. They're each trying to do something good, um, but the acts they take are irreversible, mm -hmm. right? And so the problem is, even if a bunch of them show self-restraint, one of them eventually is going to take that action, which and none of them can undo it. And so an example of this would be geoengineering. Like, mm -hmm. imagine that climate change gets really bad, and we're like, oh no, we need to do something. We need to engineer our environment to reduce climate change. If you had, you know, 100 well-intentioned actors, 99 might constrain themselves, and then one goes ahead and does gene engineering. That affects everyone, and we can't yeah. do it. So, and, and artificial intelligence is like this. You, you just takes one group to build something that. Yeah, there's only yeah. one winner, and everyone is loser. Even if everyone's trying to do good, you know, it, it can still be a really big problem. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have a lot of a lot of struggles, but um, let's be more positive. So. Um, do you think that we live in a good world now? Like, what is good outside? <laughs> you know, I think that we're. I think it, one can take a lot of gratitude in like existing at all. Mm. Like, I think it's sort of incredible that we, we yeah. exist, and mm. uh, you know, we're still alive, yeah. and you know, we have opportunities and choices. And I think that's mm. wonderful. And so, I think that's sort of the, the optimistic side. I think the negative side is just the amount of suffering in the world is tremendously mm. large. Um, still, yeah. It's yeah. improving, but still it's tremendous. Yeah, it really, you know, I think in a ton of ways the world has really gotten a lot better. If you compare, you know, I'd much rather be alive now than 300 years ago. Right, yeah. um, but on the other hand, there's still way too much suffering in the mm. world compared yeah. to what I think most people would want yeah. there to be. And, you know, we have to just continue working hard to make it better. Hmm. And um, how to, like, make more people or how to help more people to understand uh, that this is important and to, I don't know, start a movement or something. Because I really think that many people, they just don't care. Like they have their lives and they're like, okay, there's climate change, but I don't care. How to make them more, I don't know, like uh, maybe it's about courage, maybe it's about, I don't know, values, but how to like make more people to really care, take care about the future. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think part of it is really believing it on a visceral level. Mm-hmm. Like these things can be very abstract, like, oh yeah, climate change or, you know, threats of new technologies. But like to make it more visceral and be like, no, like here are specific things that we're talking about that might happen in your lifetime. Like your children or you yourself may have this specific consequence. Visualize it and bringing it because because what happens is, you know, this idea of like near mode and far mode distinction Mm -hmm. in psychology where like the near mode is like things that like I'm talking to you right now. I'm experiencing this Mm -hmm. far mode is like threat from future intelligence in 20 years. And we just don't process it in the same level. Mm. And so I think things to bring it to that level with visual, even visualization techniques mm-hmm. or really giving, or even stories that make it really visceral when you really, you start to, to care more. But it's a really hard question. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> For example, with climate change, th- there is a lot of people that uh, they think it's not happening. Yeah? Th- there is uh, a lot of people that th- they just don't believe facts and they have those alternative facts. That's bullshit. Of course, there are only one facts. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. for me, it's sometimes like uh, I read a beautiful research about um, connection between uh, having agency and depression. Like if you don't right. feel agency, you have higher chance of depression. Like learned and, helplessness and that yeah. kind of thing. And yeah. mm-hmm. I really think that many of people, they don't feel agency in that. Like they really don't yeah. feel that they can change something. And that's maybe the reason why they just... Uh, think that it's not happening because it's easier for them than to accept that it's getting worse and worse. Yeah, and I think that's right. If people don't feel like there's something they can do, well, why mm-hmm. should they take any action? And why shouldn't they kind of just ignore it and go and go about their daily lives? Um, but I think another thing that's sort of um, also really important is that a lot of the techniques people use to try to solve these problems are just not very effective. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for example, there's just been miserable failures at getting people to, do, to adopt personal lifestyle changes that are against their own self-interest. Right. You know, people say, oh, you should do X, Y, Z for the environment, but it actually is better on an individual level to not do X, Y, Z, and people don't do it. And this, we, you know, we, I feel like, you know, we need to learn the mm-hmm. lesson that some mm-hmm. strategies just don't work. So if we if we're going to solve these problems, we have to like really first figure out what are the effective mm-hmm. strategies, and what are the most effective strat- strategies, uh, for example, for for normal family to fight climate change. I you know I don't know I'm not certainly not an okay. expert in climate change. But what, uh, what do you do like personally? Like I guess that you you are the one who who wants to like do something good uh, in this field too. So what do you per- do personally? So the way the way I think about doing good yeah. is I think that um, it's really good to have specialization of labor. Mm-hmm. So I focus on social science. So we focus on trying to fight depression, anxiety, make people better decision makers, reduce bias. Um, I think it's really important that people are working on climate change, and I'm glad they're doing that. And I want them to be really good at that, and I want to try to focus on being really good on the social science side. So I don't have good answers for climate change. I hope that people do. But I do know that a lot of strategies that people try are not effective because, and this is why I think some of the ideas of effective altruism are so important. Mm -hmm. If our goal is really to try to reduce damage to our planet that has huge negative consequences to humans, well, what is the most effective strategy to do that? We're going to have to use reason and evidence to figure it out. And that means we have to be really good reasoners and we have to be really good at collecting and evaluating evidence or we're not going to use the right strategies. And and I don't think these, I think a lot of times these movements that have Mm -hmm. a lot of idealism, they don't have the evidence piece. And so they're not really looking for the effective strategies very hard. Yeah, that's very sad. Like, yeah, it's what I feel is the same. Like, it's mostly based on emotions. It's about, I don't know, uh, f- fighting uh, plastic straws, but that's not the main problem. It's a huge distraction. And, you know, I think about this with animals, too, is like there, there's a huge movement against wearing fur. Mm-hmm. But the, the and, you know, wearing fur can cause harm to animals for sure. But the but that it's such a tiny portion of the problem. Mm-hmm. And it's just sort of, it almost is distracting from the real more fundamental problems that like, mm-hmm. We just treat animals incredibly badly, and most of them are food animals, and most of those food animals are chickens. So why is nobody talking about chickens at all ever? You know, yeah, poor chickens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Chickens yeah. like are the most mistreated almost yeah. of any any creature on the earth. So, yeah, and so you know, so I, I see a lot of things like that. And so actually, I've run some studies on um, personality traits. That I think are very important for developing cultures mm-hmm. and communities. And two of these traits are um, one I call seekingness, which is mm-hmm. Believing that other people whose ideas are different than yours have valuable things to say, valuable, they're, they're valuable things to learn from them. And then this, this other trait um, of skepticism of a very specific form, it's skepticism, meaning that when you hear new ideas, that you vet them very carefully before you believe them. 
Okay. And so these, uh, this, this dual duality of seekingness and skepticism, I think it's incredibly important for building community, whether you're building community of environmentalists or effective altruists mm -hmm. or whatever. And the idea is that if, you, if your community doesn't have a high level of skepticism, the problem is you let in lots of bad, dumb ideas. Right. right. You just you don't have a vetting right. filter. Right. And so you see this, for example, in some new age communities where they, you know, they believe in every crazy thing about oh, this heals you and that heals you. And maybe they're right about some of them, but then maybe they're totally wrong about others. And so there's not there's not that vetting. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, um, if you don't have this seeking this property where you're actively going out trying to pull in the best ideas from others. What happens is a community kind of ossifies. It has the same ideas mm -hmm. it did 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you actually see this in some skeptical communities, I think, where they just they're still talking about the same thing they were 20 years ago. And it's like, OK, but where are the new good ideas coming from? And so I think to create good communities, whether it's environmentalism or, mm -hmm. or whatever, <clears throat> is promoting these, these dual things of skepticism and seekingness together. Yeah, I definitely like this concept because I think that if you are too much skeptical, then you just uh, end alone and uh, you doubt everything and you have uh, struggles to connect with other people because you always find things that you can disagree yeah. and at the end like you disagree with everyone and you cannot like uh, unite people if you are just skeptical. Exactly. I think of this idea, this metaphor of like a, someone who's hunting for gems. Like you're hunting for gems. You know most things are not going to be gems, but you know there are gems out there. So you're looking really hard. But you're not going to confuse a piece of coal for a gem. You're going to inspect yeah. it carefully. So it's like you, the ideal is you're going about the world knowing there's a lot of valuable ideas you haven't heard yet from other people that are very different mm -hmm. from you. But when you hear a new idea, you're going to look at it carefully and make sure it really is rigorous. Um, and I think that's sort of the ideal. And um, on clearthinking, uh, clearthinking.org, we're actually launching a, a test where you can measure your skeptical and seekingness. That's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. At the end of um, my podcast, I want to discuss uh, your values. So what are your values? Uh, why you have those values? And tell me more about your personality too. Uh, yeah, so I thought about this a lot because we're building this test for measuring mm -hmm. people's intrinsic values. Um, so I would say some of my core values are reducing suffering. So doing mm -hmm. things like uplift for depression or app. Um, uh, increasing happiness. So I'm clear thinking we've got mm -hmm. tools that help people become happier. Um, Another core value of mine is seeking truth, like just like you, mm -hmm. is I, I care about, you know, I don't just care about suffering. I also want people to have true beliefs. I wouldn't think it was an incredibly good outcome if the way mm -hmm. we choose happiness was by diluting everyone. Right, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, sure, that's better mm -hmm. than everyone suffering all the time, mm -hmm. but it's not an ideal society. Yes, sometimes I have struggled to really recognize, like, uh, you, you have those communities, you, you mentioned the... Uh, uh, how, how you call them? Like a new, uh, new age, new age, new age yeah. uh, people. And at the end, you think that okay, they are happier, but they are deluded. So sometimes I feel like I'm. Should I do something like that, like, or leave them alone and leave them be happy in uh, with, with those I don't know, yeah. painting glasses. Well the thing is, I think they're, you know, going back to this this phrase I used before of philosophical disorders. Mm -hmm. There's so many people who are, have false beliefs that are harming them. It feels like that's more clear-cut case, let's work on that. If someone has a false belief that's that's benefiting them, okay, maybe just let it lie for now at least until we've solved them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but I but I do really care about truth intrinsically. Yeah. Right, yeah, because optimizing only on happiness can end it very bad. Yeah. So so uh, what are other values or is that so, all? Uh, like, no, I certainly have other values. So, free, like so another value I care about is not causing large amounts of harm in order to do good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might say, well, if I can cause, you know, 999 units of harm and get out of that a thousand units of benefit mm -hmm. for the world, well, I'm doing good, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think my moral system says, no, you should avoid, you should avoid causing huge amounts of harm, even if you think that it's going to so cause you, slightly more good. So you, you are not utilitarian. I'm not a pure, so I'm more utilitarian than the vast majority of people on this okay. earth, but I'm not a pure utilitarian, okay. and okay. that's one way I deviate. Is that um, so? If the amount of good was good, it was enough. Like yes, mm -hmm. of course, for I call it cause a small amount of harm to cause a huge amount of good, mm -hmm. but but I would but I tend to be very reluctant to try to co like cause a large okay. amount of harm to okay. cause a bigger amount of good. So just yeah, you are part utilitarian, but. Yeah. I think of it as I have a utilitarian, like part of my value system. It's a pretty big chunk of my value system, mm -hmm. but there are these other parts as well, that, like the truth-seeking part, which is not pure utilitarian either. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, I'm always thinking about this too. Like, 
aware uh, how, how to measure and how to make a good decision. Like if you can influence a lot of people, but there's uh, a harm you, you, you do. So how to measure that? So uh, I think that these discussions are very important these days because like everyone is making decision in businesses all the time. Like they are mm -hmm. doing new products and they have a large influence that there are people are working in marketing, they are uh, promoting uh, products they don't believe if yeah. those products are good. And those are the discussions I'm uh, having with a lot of managers these days. How to really do good things, but still uh, survive in a global society yeah. and work, working in a corporation and so on. So how to measure like how much harm they do or how much good they do. Yeah. Well, you know, I think about this because because um, mm -hmm. company, my company, Sparkware, where we we actually create new products and new companies mm -hmm. from them. Um, well, how do we come up with ideas for products, right? And so, uh, one way people come up with ideas for products is they try to see what will people buy, right? Mm -hmm. Well, can I sell to someone? And I think part of the problem with that is that there are ways to sell things to people that aren't beneficial, right? And a classic example mm -hmm. is that some companies sell supplements that don't work, yep. but they're very successful at selling them because when you buy a supplement nutritional supplement, you can't necessarily tell if it helps. And if mm. the branding is really good, yeah. maybe it can persuade you, you know? So I don't like that approach as much of saying, what will people buy? I like to say, what's valuable? And start mm -hmm. there and say, well, one thing that's really valuable is not being as depressed. Mm -hmm. If we can produce a product that helps people be less depressed, that would be a true value. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to focus on trying to produce that. So it's like, I think of it as like a value first perspective rather than value a... Value first perspective yeah. is a great, yeah. Uh, I sometimes call it like purpose-driven organizations. Yeah, like yeah. Really focus on values in the first and then uh, the money. So, yeah. well, and uh, do you think it's getting better? Like, uh, do you have any good examples of companies they really change their behavior in that? Well, you know, I think when you get to large companies, it mm -hmm. becomes a closer and closer approximation to think of them as sort of profit maximizing machines. Mm -hmm. Because they are on stock market. Yeah, they have pressures from investors and... Mm -hmm. You know, and investors might exert, you know, if the CEO is not doing a good job ma yeah. of maximum profit, there might be pressure. Now, there are exceptions. There are certainly exceptions. But for smaller companies, I think it's more driven by, like, mm -hmm. who is the leader? Mm -hmm. What do they want? Um, but, you know, so because I think a lot of large companies can be best models, they're not perfect at profit maximizing. Mm -hmm. They're flawed at profit maximizing, but, they're, but they largely can be modeled that as mm -hmm. profit maximizers, right? I think we have to think about a lot of the system that they're in. Mm -hmm. Because if you imagine, you've got this big lumbering machine that's trying to maximize profit. You put yeah. it in one system and it you know, grinds up humans to mm. make food mm. if it could sell them to make a profit. And you put them in another system and it creates new wonderful medical advancements mm. to save people's lives. What's the difference? It's just about how can the machine make profit? Mm. You, so you have to be, you re, and that's where I think regulation comes in is mm. a key aspect of regulation is it has to make it so you can't make money hurting people. Right. If it can, then the regulators, not the, the you can't blame the for-profit machine because that's mm. literally what it's designed to do is make mm. profit, right? Mm. But you, you know, always regulations are very like difficult if they you are. have a free market. Like it's it's so tricky to do a regulation that works. I totally agree. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think people people often think, people who are pro-regulation think, mm. oh yeah, they should just regulate that. Regulating a complex system is mm -hmm. incredibly hard. First of all, even understanding the system, but second of all, it's adversarial because as soon as you try to regulate it, all the people who are negatively affected, all the companies are going to hire tons of lawyers to try to subvert your regulation. Mm -hmm. And not only that, they get subverted during the process of creating them. Yeah. So lawmakers make a regulation, other lawmakers like modify it and tweak it, yeah. companies lobby, by the mm -hmm. time it even gets produced, it's not even the original intent. So, um, that be, so my perspective is that regulation is incredibly important, but it should be focused on the cases that are most, most clear cut, where mm -hmm. it's clear where the market failure is, and it's and there's clear mm -hmm. strategies to correct it. Mm -hmm. For me, another strategy yeah. is to uh, to really teach uh, customers to choose brands that they have some really uh, I don't know believable values that they really uh, like using in their. Uh, for example, production or so, yeah. so like, like I don't know, the fair trade movement and so on. So I really think that the future customer should really uh, take care where he's spending his money. And that's a huge influence. So right. there should be like uh, top down the regulation way and yeah. the bottom up the teach customers to be more responsible. Yeah. And I think, that's, a, I think that's important. But I do think a challenge with that is that um, companies can talk the talk. All oh, right. Yeah. I, like they can say, oh, we're fair trade, but maybe it's just 1% of their products oh, are fair right, trade, right? right? Yeah. 
So, but I think if we have good a kind of, uh, if we have good, say, nonprofits mm -hmm. that are kind of checking that the stuff they're doing, what they're saying, mm -hmm. or, you know, or that information, you know, a lot of transparency, that can really help because then people can really say, okay, you say you're doing this good, but are you really doing it? How much are you doing it? My favorite question is, uh, and I'm always using this question is, uh, what is the purpose of life according to your experience? Oh, softball, easy question, right? <laughs> so I take the perspective that we evolved um, over you know millions of years, that we're biological beings, that mm. the reason our brains the way they are is because they help with survival. Um, so I don't think we have, so evolution is sort of a blind process. It's not, in right. it's not intelligent mm -hmm. per se. It's mm -hmm. just the thing that happens to produce genes spreads more, you know, it's almost tautological. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we're endowed with any kind of global purpose, but I think we're the, it happens to be the case that the kind of brain we have is a brain that can have feelings of meaning and purpose. And so I think that we each can do things that we find meaningful based on our own values. Mm -hmm. We're kind of lucky in that way. Evolution <clears throat> might have built yep. us in a different way where we couldn't yep. have meaning at all. Yep. But it's it's very good that uh, our brain reward system is designed by evolution that we have positive emotions if we are doing something good. Exactly. That's, yeah. That's so cool. Like being happy and doing something good, good together. Well. Yeah. You can imagine <laughs> imagine a world where there was almost no room for cooperation for some uh -huh. reason. You know, maybe food just randomly appears on the surface of the earth. And mm -hmm. everyone just has to run and try to grab it first. Mm -hmm. And there's no cooperation. You know, in such a world, you may not have altruism mm -hmm. develop. And if you didn't have altruism, we'd be very different creatures. But fortunately, we're in a world where cooperation was incredibly important. And so we actually are extremely altruistic beings in a lot of ways. We're also selfish. Yep. But, you know, we have this kind of hybrid system going on. So yeah, yeah. I call it sometimes like ego 1.0 that is selfish and ego 2.0 mm -hmm. that is selfless. You're doing something uh, yeah. for the others. And uh, I love uh, reading research about those two yeah. concepts. Like there, there's a beautiful book uh, from Adam Grant, The Give and Take. Yeah, yeah. There's beautiful research uh, from uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he wrote a book, um, R Righteous Mind. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I really think that sometimes like uh, w w many people are just stuck in a, that ego 1.0 system. Like they are just yeah. selfish. They are those uh, takers and but all of them if they are not psychopaths they have capacity to upgrade their mind and start to do more good and at the end feel uh, positive emotions yeah and I, well I think that some people underestimate the extent to which so much of human happiness and meaning comes from our relationships mm. with other people right so if you're sitting on a huge pile of money but you're all alone Yep. What are you going to do? Sit on the beach alone, you know, drink mm. drinks a lot. Like really a lot of our, a lot of the best things in life come from really strong, po mutually positive relationships. And so if you try to maximize those, actually you become much more selfless and I think a lot of times happier. So, yeah. One problem about this is that you experience those positive emotions even if you are flawed. So <laughs> if you believe that you are helping people, for yeah. example, you have that company that is doing a very shitty uh, supplement product, but maybe the owner believes that he is helping people and exactly. he has those positive emotions. Maybe Hitler had a lot of positive emotions because he really believed in uh, what he did. So uh, how to avoid this, to, to be flawed, like to really uh, yeah. believe that you are saving the world, but at the end you are destroying it and you don't know that. It's it's such a huge problem. You could argue that a lot of the bad things in the world come about from idealists trying mm -hmm. to do good, but yeah. in misguided ways. Yeah. You know, if you think about, for example, religious fundamentalists trying to push their worldview and force mm -hmm. everyone to act a certain way, they probably think they're doing good, yeah. right? Um, or, you know, authoritarian ideologies, mm -hmm. a lot of them think they're going good, uh, even if they're actually causing suffering, right? Uh, I think it's such a critical thing. And, and that's, again, where, you know, evidence and reason come in. And, mm. you know, I think um, to get really, really specific, like you really can train your skills in reason. You can train your mm. skills in evaluation of evidence. Um, we have tons of tools on our website to do this. And doing this, I think really at the end of the day, it helps you say, OK, what do I really want? Do I want to feel like I'm doing good or do I actually want to do good? Right, and yeah. I think most people, they actually want to do good. But the problem is once they get in too deep, Mm. Once they've spent 10 years doing the thing a certain way, yep. at that point, it's very hard for them to realize that they mm. haven't done good. So yeah. the earlier you can develop the skills, you can actually start using them before you mm. spend 10 years digging yourself into a mm. hole of doing ineffective things, right? Yep. 
Yeah. That's the problem of uh, Dunning Kruger effect. Like people, they don't uh, they don't realize uh, realize uh, the, the parts that they are unskilled, and they feel they are uh, they feel that they are skilled even if they are unskilled. So I really think that all people that they are working in charities and uh, they are trying to do a lot of good sometimes they have flawed and at the end maybe we should train them in critical thinking first and then let them to do uh charities it's one thing i really like about the effective altruism movement yeah. is that um because it's taking seriously this idea of doing like how do we do the most good that requires real like a ton of rigor yeah. it doesn't mean that the community always gets the answers right it doesn't mean that you know people aren't biased of course they are But people are, I think, are trying harder to mm. debug their biases because they're trying to answer that really difficult question. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, altruistic communities would benefit from more rigor. Yeah. So thank you very much. It was a great discussion. So And for me, like as I said, like you have the same values uh, as I do. So for me, it's great that uh, I found someone like you. And. You you were a guest in my podcast, so thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. And yeah. I definitely uh, invite you in the future for another talk because it was so great. That would be great. And we have a lot of things to discuss uh, later too. So thank you very much for listening, guys, and uh, see you soon. Thank you.